Good morning, everyone. Today is April 20th. It is Monday. It's beautiful outside. I think it's going to be a great week. I'm excited. I think we're all kind of hitting our groove here. So today we are going to start a story. It's written by the same guy who wrote The Landlady. It's one of my favorites. Um, and we are going to look very, very specifically at situational irony and dramatic irony. Okay. So when we're reading it, I want you to really think for situational, what is a character doing that we wouldn't have expected based on how they acted earlier? Okay. So it's that difference. So you want to pay attention to the very beginning. How are our characters set up? And then think about how their actions tie in with the way that we perceived them at the beginning. Towards the end, we're going to start thinking about dramatic irony. So what do we know that some of those characters don't know? Okay, so situational, you're trying to think, how is somebody acting that I wouldn't have expected? And dramatic, what do I know as the reader that somebody in here doesn't know? Okay, so make sure that you're paying attention because I'm going to be explaining a lot of things as we go along and it'll really help you to make sure that you watch the whole video. All right, let's get started. Okay, part one, that link will be on there, okay? The room was warm and clean, the curtains drawn, the two table lamps alight, hers and the one by the empty chair opposite. So they're setting that stage for you. On the sideboard behind her, two tall glasses, soda water, whiskey, fresh ice cubes in the thermos bucket. Mary Maloney was waiting for her husband to come home from work. So she's ready. She's like, oh, he's coming home. Now and again, she would glance up at the clock, but without anxiety, merely to please herself with the thought that each minute gone by made it nearer the time when he would come. There was a slow, smiling air about her and about everything she did. The drop of her head as she bent over her sewing was curiously tranquil. Her skin, for this was her sixth month with child, had acquired a wonderful, translucent quality. The mouth was soft and the eyes with their new placid look seemed larger, darker than before. So she's peaceful and calm, just sewing and waiting. Can't wait for her husband to come home from work. When the clock said 10 minutes to five, she began to listen. And a few moments later, punctually as always, she heard the tires on the gravel outside and the car door slamming, the footsteps passing the window, the key turning in the lock. She laid aside her sewing, stood up and went forward to kiss him as he came in. Hello, darling, she said. Hello, he answered. She took his coat and hung it in the closet. Then she walked over and made the drinks, a strongish one for him, a weak one for herself. And soon she was back again in her chair with the sewing, and he and the other opposite, holding the tall glass with both his hands, rocking it so the ice cubes tinkled against the side. So we can get the sense that this is like their routine. She's like this traditional wife. This was written in like the 50s. She's the traditional wife. Like, oh, I just love my husband so much. Let me cater to you, blah, 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 blah. And he comes home and... He, she gets the drink ready and then they sit together. For her, this was always a blissful time of day. She knew he didn't want to speak much until the first drink was finished. And she, on her side, was content to sit quietly, enjoying his company after the long hours alone in the house. She loved to luxuriate in the presence of this man and to feel, almost as a sunbather feels the sun, that warm male glow that came out of him to her when they were alone together. She loved him for the way he sat loosely in a chair, for the way he came in a door, or moved slowly across the room with long strides. She loved the intent, far look in his eyes when they rested on her, the funny shape of the mouth, and especially the way he remained silent about his tiredness, sitting still with himself until the whiskey had taken some of it away. So this whole paragraph is telling us, like, she loves her husband. She loves everything about him. She is so in love with him. Tired, darling? Yes, he said, I'm tired. And as he spoke, he did an unusual thing. He lifted his glass and drained it in one swallow, although there was still half of it, at least half of it left. She wasn't really watching him, but she knew what he had done because she heard the ice cubes falling back against the bottom of the empty glass when he lowered his arm. He paused a moment, leaning forward in the chair. Then he got up and went slowly over to fetch himself another. So he just like was like, shoop. So what does that tell us about him right now? What kind of feeling do we get? I'll get it, she cried, jumping up. Sit down, he said. 
When he came back, she noticed that the new drink was dark amber with the quantity of whiskey in it, so a really strong one. Darling, shall I get your slippers? No. She watched him as he began to sip the dark yellow drink, and she could see little oily swirls in the liquid because it was so strong. I think it's a shame, she said, that when a policeman gets to be as senior as you, they keep him walking about on his feet all day long. He didn't answer, so she bent her head again and went on with her sewing. But each time he lifted the drink to his lips, she heard the ice cubes clinking against the side of the glass. Darling, she said, would you like some cheese? I haven't made any supper because it's Thursday. No, he said. If you're too tired to eat out, she went on, it's still not too late. There's plenty of meat and stuff in the freezer, and you can have it right here and not even move out of the chair. Her eyes waited on him for an answer, a smile, a little nod, but he made no sign. So here we're starting to get a weird feeling. She's being really accommodating and loving, and he's giving her nothing. He's not responding to anything. Anyway, she went on, I'll get you some cheese and crackers first. I don't want it, he said. She moved uneasily in her chair, so she's starting to get nervous. The large eyes still watching his face. But you must have supper. I can easily do it here. I'd like to do it. We can have lamb chops or pork, anything you want, everything in the freezer. Forget it, he said. But darling, you must eat. I'll fix it anyway, and then you can have it or not, as you like. She stood up and placed her sewing on the table by the lamp. Sit down, he said. Just for a minute, sit down. It wasn't till then that she began to get frightened. Go on, he said. Sit down. So think in your head, what do you think he's going to tell her? What do you think is happening right now? Why is he being weird? Why is she like, oh God, something weird's happening? She lowered herself back slowly into the chair, watching him all the time with those large, bewildered eyes. So just like, oh. He had finished the second drink and was staring down into the glass, frowning. Listen, he said, I've got something to tell you. What is it, darling? What's the matter? He had become absolutely motionless and he kept his head down so that the light from the lamp beside him fell across the upper part of his face, leaving the chin and mouth in shadow. She noticed there was a little muscle moving near the corner of his left eye. This is going to be a bit of a shock to you, I'm afraid, he said, but I've thought about it a good deal and I've decided the only thing to do is to tell you right away. I hope you won't blame me too much. And he told her. It didn't take long, four or five minutes at most, and she sat very still through it all watching him with a kind of dazed horror as he went further and further away from her with each word. So right now, it, they hasn't told us what he said, but something that's pulling him away from her. So there it is, he added, and I know it's kind of a bad time to be telling you, but there simply wasn't any other way. Of course, I'll give you money and see you're looked after, but there needn't really be any fuss. I hope not anyway. It wouldn't be very good for my job. Her first instinct was to not believe any of it, to reject it all. It occurred to her that perhaps he hadn't even spoken, that she herself had imagined the whole thing. Maybe if she went about her business and acted as though she hadn't been listening, then later when she sort of woke up again, she would find that none of it had ever happened. So because it's telling us he's going to give her money and see that she's looked after, we can infer that he's leaving her. So he told her while she is six months with child that he is leaving her. And she's like shocked. I'll get the supper, she managed to whisper. And this time he didn't stop her. So now she's like, I'm just gonna go about things normally. When she walked across the room, she couldn't feel her feet touching the floor. She couldn't feel anything at all, except a slight nausea and a desire to vomit. Everything was automatic now. Down the stairs to the cellar, the light switch, the deep freeze, the hand inside the cabinet taking hold of the first object it met. She lifted it out and looked at it. It was wrapped in paper, so she took off the paper and looked at it again. A leg of lamb. All right, then. They would have lamb for supper. She carried it upstairs, holding the thin bone end of it with both her hands, and as she went through the living room, she saw him standing over by the window with his back to her, and she stopped. For God's sake, he said, hearing her, but not turning around. Don't make supper for me. I'm going out. At that point, Mary Maloney simply walked up behind him, and without any pause, she swung the big frozen leg of lamb high in the air and brought it down as hard as she could on the back of his head. She j might just as well have hit him with a steel club. She stepped back a pace, waiting, and the funny thing was that he remained standing there for at least four or five seconds, gently swaying. Then 
he crashed to the carpet. So now is when I want you to think about that situational irony. You're thinking, what has happened that I would not have expected based on these people, okay? The violence of the crash, the noise, the small table overturning helped bring her out of the shock. She came out slowly, feeling cold and surprised, and she stood for a while blinking at the body, still holding the ridiculous piece of meat tight with both hands. All right, she told herself, so I've killed him. It was extraordinary now how clear her mind had become all of a sudden. She began thinking very fast. As the wife of a detective, she knew quite well what the penalty would be. So again, we're thinking about that irony. So now she's killed her husband. That was fine. It made no difference to her. In fact, it would be a relief. On the other hand, what about the child? What were the laws about murderers with unborn children? Did they kill them both, mother and child? Or did they wait until the 10th month? What did they do? Mary Maloney didn't know, and she certainly wasn't prepared to take that chance. She carried the meat into the kitchen, placed it in a pan, turned the oven on high, and shoved it inside. Then she washed her hands and ran upstairs to the bedroom. She sat down before the mirror, tidied her face, touched up her lips and face. She tried to smile, but it came out rather peculiar. She tried again, so she's looking at herself like, Hi. Okay. Normal. Here. Hello, Sam, she said brightly, aloud. The voice sounded peculiar, too. Ahem. I, I want some potatoes, please, Sam. Yes, and I think a can of peas. That was better. Both the smile and the voice were coming out better now. She rehearsed it several times more. Then she ran downstairs, took her coat, went out the back door, down the garden, and into the street. It wasn't six o'clock yet, and the lights were still on at the grocery shop. So this is where we're stopping for part one, okay? So we have met our characters, Mary and Patrick, and Mary was in, is, loves her husband. He tells her, bye, I'm leaving you even though you're pregnant. And then she kills him by swinging a giant frozen leg of lamb. So like, you got to think, it's not like the soft meat. It's not like she like smacked him in the face with like a piece of chicken. Like it's like this giant like bat basically, okay? It's like out of the deep freezer and she kills him. And now she's going to the grocery store, okay? So your exit slip is down here. I don't know what that is. Hopefully that works. If not, it's attached to the assignment on Google Classroom as well. If you've made it this far and have listened to everything, I believe that the exit slip will be very, very easy for you. So make sure that you are writing in complete sentences. I'm not going to give credit for IDK and I don't know and anything that's not written in a complete sentence. You are in eighth grade. You can write a complete sentence. This is getting a little ridiculous. So make sure that you're putting in that effort. It's just the exit slip, not an independent practice. The exit slip is easier for those of you working on your phones. It's, I think, 10 questions. So go ahead and get that done. And we will finish this story on Wednesday.